Good morning, everybody. How is everyone today? <coughs> I need some energy from the audience. This is a very important, <laughs> like, discussion. <laughs> All right, we got you out there. So um, this morning we're going to talk about a topic that we all know very well, the state of innovation in Europe, <coughs> but from, you know, multiple different points. We've got fund of funds, we've got venture, we've got government, and um, with that, I'd like each of you just to do a really quick introduction to yourself. So Jean-David, all of you met earlier, but just a, a quick intro, just to see how you fit into this panel. <laughs> no, thanks a lot, Bindi. So I'm Jean-David Malo, I'm the... Uh director of the European Innovation Council and SME Executive Agency, working in this area now, I think, for 15 years, starting with uh, debt financing together with EIF and EIB. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, very uh, passionate, yes. in fact, by the access to finance for innovation. Great. And Mariut, CEO of the European Investment Fund, talk a little bit about yourself, please. Thank you so much. Indeed, the first female... Uh, CEO of the European Investment Fund. Hey! hey. Well done. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, since my professional life, I am a st strong promoter of attracting private sector financing in all types of investment, whether this is infrastructure, whether this is venture capital, private equity, because this is important part. We can only partner the public sector with the private one. Yeah. And on the top of that, I'm a strong pr promoter of female entrepreneurship. Absolutely. Well, we had a good yeah. chat about that <laughs> off stage, didn't we? <laughs> Chris Wade from Isomer. I want to ask for everyone who has done anything with entrepreneurship to put their hands up now. The entire room, look Good. at that. The yes. entire yes. room, Yes, that's look fantastic. At that. 2014, this is an audience participation bit. <laughs> 2014, how many unicorns were there in Europe? Anybody? <laughs> Raf is saying zero. That's not true. There are Come on, someone. What's the number? Ten. We're here. The ten. answer <laughs> was fourteen. My partner and I decided to do something about that, and we built a firm to back early stage VCs across the whole of Europe, to back them, to back their companies. Last year, I was talking about cowboy every five seconds, and I hope you've all bought a cowboy bike, because it is going to be uh, <laughs> Brussels' uh, great unicorn for sure. And we believed that there could be at least 400 unicorns in the next five years. We're almost there. I now know where it comes from, because you have a factory for them, <laughs> which, is, which is fantastic. But Isomer is backing you. That's great. And last but not least, Michael hey. Jackson, MJ, Hi. as we How call you. everybody? Um, so, Michael Jackson, um, still alive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Do you know there are three Michael Jacksons in Europe that work in there's venture? There's four, actually. There's a, actually a fourth yeah, MJ. There's a fourth one. Wow, okay. <laughs> um, this is great. I know, we need to, if we get a fifth, it's going to be the Jackson yeah. Five. Just Maybe I should change box. my name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Michaela uh, Jackson. Is that a rumor? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyways. So tell um, us about multiple. So yeah, so I am, uh, I've been a deep tech entrepreneur and VC for almost 20 years now on both sides of the Atlantic. So I've seen Europe sort of through the whole growth phase of the last 15 years. I saw 15 years ago when, you know, there was not much of the venture capital ecosystem here. I remember 15 years ago, being on a panel in this very city with someone from the EIF. So to see kind of the evolution of the ecosystem here has been uh, interesting. There's some pros, there's some cons, obviously. Um, we'll talk about that later. Always. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so investing in deep tech companies, I sit on the boards of uh, government-affiliated funds, private funds, uh, fund of funds, direct investments, family offices, private banks. So I see the ecosystem from a fairly holistic and comprehensive standpoint. So happy to be here. Great, Let's thank get it going. you. So I'm going to start with the first question, and I know we're going to have wildly differing uh, points right. of view on this one, but I'm going to ask all of you to behave a bit too. <laughs> oh. so you, that's, that's for you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> We've all read your LinkedIn posts, which are great. Um, I want to hear each of your perspectives on what 
the European innovation DNA is really about and what makes us really special in the European continent. Now, Jean-David, I've had the pleasure of uh, being on EIC board with you since 2017. Yeah. And because of the B word, I'm now an ambassador for EIC. <laughs> but I want to hear how you've seen things change um, since the launch of that and where you think we're at now. Um, I think what makes uh, Europe uh, unique in, in this context and how the uh, EIC also has evolved in this context is um, first that we have a strong policy objective in Europe that makes us, I would say, slightly different to, the, to our main competitors. Uh, we are fully engaged in the uh, twin transition, uh, so the digital one, but I would say even more the climate one and the environment yeah. environmental one. And sustainability in this context is absolutely at the heart of any of our policy. Um, second, uh, we have uh, an approach to innovation, which is, of course, um, uh, associated to the principle of agi agility, flexibility, responsiveness. This is clear, but this is something that you can find also in the US or in China. But where also we are very attached to um, uh, ethics, we are very attached to um, innovation with a purpose, not innovation at any price. Uh, and this explains the reason why, for example, we are uh, continuing to think about uh, relevant regulation in order to accompany the, um, the, um, the evolution, uh, the quick evolution uh, on, uh, on the technology, in particular on deep tech technology. It's a case for AI, it's a case for the CHIPS Act, it's a case for any of these kind of things. Um, so this is certainly what makes the main difference, if I could yeah. say it quickly, uh, on our okay. side. Now, Mario, you've been in post close to six months, <laughs> and, and, and I'd just love to hear what you see <coughs> as our innovation DNA. What makes us special? Because I, I guarantee you're probably talking to your counterparts across the globe. So what is the differentiator for us? There's a lot of courage in the European Union. And I think uh, what Jean-David uh, Jean said before, the research is there, and we need even more courage to bring this to the market. So uh, where we are good is very good. We are research, we have talent, mm -hmm. but we need to do more in order to bring the innovation onto the, on, on, onto the markets. And here, I think, when we look at the European Union, there has been a lot that has been developed, many different instruments, either at the European Union level or member states level, or also regionally, and together with the private sector, a lot is over there that help can help entrepreneurship to grow. So I think what we just need to is somehow to do more in the European Union is to get this innovation indeed into the yeah. fab, the factory. Yeah. Yes. And, and then I'm going to switch over to the private sector view. So Chris, from a fund of funds perspective, we met way back in the day. 2011. Like, like way back. <laughs> yeah, yes. we're, we're both old, right? Well, maybe I am, not you. You're, you're young, <laughs> no, you're, always. I, I am old, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, what, what have you seen? Obviously, you, you've been in the UK, you've been around Europe, you've been investing. Um, what, what do you think really differentiates us? I think it's very simple. We have amazing entrepreneurs. We have entrepreneurs that have had to fight harder because there's been less capital. They have had to innovate quicker. They have had to build things with adversity. Um, and we have all that. And then we have the golden value of serial entrepreneurship. I was building technology companies in the late 90s in Cambridge in the UK. They we're kind of the first generation of UK entrepreneurs. Now many, many entrepreneurs are building their second, their third, their fourth company, which means that they are not making the mistakes they made yeah. before. But the answer is, is entrepreneurship. Just look at the way entrepreneurs dealt with the pandemic. Yeah, Just absolutely. look at the way entrepreneurs dealt with this North American bank that had a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that they shall remain unnamed. Just dealt with it. And I don't mean in weeks, 
I mean in hours. And that is our yeah. value, and we should cherish it very dearly. Yeah, absolutely. And Michael, you are a transplant on this side of the pond, and you have stayed here for a very long time. Quality of life is really good in Europe. Yeah, it is wonderful here. <laughs> what keeps you here? What is special about I just, Europe? I think, it's, I think the quality of life is fantastic. I think um, if you're talking about what's one of the strengths of the European tech ecosystem, for me, it's, it's probably the education system. Um, Europe, you know, if you compare it to the US or China, on a scientific level, is on par with any of the three. It's sort of what comes after that, which is, has hiccups. Um, and, it, you know, if you're talking about, you know, if you're a scientific entrepreneur, um, oftentimes one of the issues in Europe isn't the lack of funding necessarily, but it's a lack of customer base. And I think that's something that's going to have to evolve. Yeah. So it's great to have all these public initiatives um, on board. But at the same point in time, Europe is still on a you know, per capita basis less than half the amount of venture capital yeah. that the U.S. has. Yeah. And I think Europe hasn't done an adequate enough job of bringing in the private sector. Um, yeah. It hasn't unleashed its pension fund. It's a major problem in the U.K., yeah. a major problem in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, so it's great to have a lot of these sort of government-first initiatives. But at some point in time, I think if you really, I think Europe has tremendous upside potential. I'm coming from deep tech. I think the upside potential in deep tech in Europe is phenomenal. But there's also systemic issues in the ecosystem here that you can put all the government money into it you want, but until you fix the fragmented and shallow capital markets, until you actually get um, government as consumers of the deep tech, you're still going to have these issues. So I think, so I'm just trying to balance it out a bit. Yes, phenomenal. The, the growth over 15 years has been tremendous. Um, I, I do think, though, if it's always this sort of top-down approach to sort of government's going to be the solution to everything, I think it's always going to be Speaking yeah. of the Canadian, it's going to be continuing to skate where the puck has been and not to where the puck is going. Yeah, I'm, I'm British first, Canadian second. Ah, yes. Born and raised. <laughs> I'm an immigrant to Canada. Um, I want the response from Marriott and Jean David to what uh, Mike, Michael has just spoken about. What, what are you doing? What is your strategy from an EIF <coughs> level to address some of these issues that um, Michael has mentioned? It's a very good point because when we look back, for example, 20 years when EIF was quite alone on the venture capital markets and we look at today, there are areas where we are no longer needed. And this has been taken up by other players and very much about private sector as well, but of course member states, national promotion institutions and, and, and so on. However, you know, the market in terms of sectors and also regions, they still remain very fragmented and there are always niches whether EIF intervention is needed, thanks to European Union budget money, thanks to the member states' ma mandates that we are receiving. And when we look, for example, into innovation and deep tech, when we look at the venture capital funds, EIF is still needed. I mean, when we look at the portfolio and when we look at the... Uh, there is a case for us to be there. But when we, we look at the venture capital again, we, we are talking about the scaling up, scaling up of ideas, scaling up of companies. What was recognized a year ago is that there is really a lack of European financing for scaling up larger uh, amounts Thanks into stage. innovative companies who really want to grow within the European Union. And this is why there okay. is now the European Tech Champions Initiative, which is, which is for that. Because we don't have a private sector answer for that yet. Mm. So what we have to do is that we, we develop markets where the needs are, and then hopefully, at some stage, the private sector can take over. Yeah, and, I, I and, just, I and just and want thanks. to say something that's much more important than money. And that is having sophisticated investors in venture capital. And you become sophisticated by doing it many, many years. EIF has done it for many, many years. Like everybody, they make mistakes, they grow, they improve, and they are a wonderful investor to have as a VC. And I think that's really important, and that has nothing mm. to do with money. It's just the experience. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you do learn through, mm. Uh, mm. absolutely. I think um, <clears throat> the one comment I'll make is if you look at this panel, we're observing private and pu public sector starting to collaborate, starting to understand each other's languages. And, and we're not quite there yet, but we're working on it. Mm. And, and Jean-David, I'm gonna sort of pass this question on to you because a lot of the reason you brought people like us on as board members to help you 
think about the EIC project, and you know, we do know there have been some recent bumps. Yeah. How has that collaboration worked, and how has that meant that that can help Europe advance and really accelerate? And then from there, we don't have much time. Um, Chris and Michael, I want you to talk a little bit about your views on scaling up. So Jean-David first, and then... But you said something very, very key, uh, I think, uh, Bindi, which is uh, when we start to collaborate, uh, we speak different languages. Exactly. We were, we were not talking the same language and yeah. took time also to understand each other. While in fact we discovered that we were talking about the same thing but with different wording. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which is, which, uh, and I think mm -hmm. it was a very important step. I remember it was exactly the same when we had the idea to, uh, to support uh, RDI made by large corporates. Uh, by financing it not with grants, but by guarantees and, uh, and debt financing with the EIB. I mean, I think it took two years yes. in order to understand each other before it started. Yeah. But when it started, then it, uh, it, it yeah. has grown well, very, very quickly. Yeah. The same happened with, uh, with the EIC. You remember when we had our 2017, first... 2017, yeah. Yes, in 2017, 20, uh, 2018. It took time, in fact, to understand each other and then to elaborate, in fact, what was needed in order to tackle the issues that we have identified and that I, I recalled earlier. But to complement, in fact, uh, what was said before by, uh, by my uh, very distinguished panelists, um, I think that uh, the fact that we have started this cooperation and that we are intensifying this cooperation is helping, in fact, to go quicker in the next step. It took time to establish, for example, the European Innovation Council, which was complementing, in fact, a segment where we were not addressing the market failures. Uh, the part which is covered now by, since 20 years or even more by the EIF and the EIB, which is a bit later, in fact, in the, in the, in the growth stage, uh, is delivering, let's say, yeah. honestly, very well so in close cooperation with private partners. But the main challenge is the late stage today. And I'm always saying something a bit uh, not diplomatic, but uh, if we are not addressing the late stage, what we are doing in Europe is, in fact, preparing a wonderful, a wonderful pipeline for our main competitors. Yeah, and I think, Jean-David, we need to talk about speed, right? Yes. And so, I, I know Michael and Chris are going to have good comments on that, because we only have two minutes left. <laughs> so I want the comments on <laughs> speed of growth and how you think we can collaborate with our, you know, governmental partners to get that speed of growth and to get entrepreneurs to the next level and double the amount of unicorns that we have in innovation. So, Michael, I know you have lots of views so on I, that. I think, I think one of the things is, I think you shouldn't get in this whole game of, of unicorn or not unicorn. Uh, you know, a, a European government might come out and say, hey, we want 25 unicorns. Ultimately, it's just a vanity metric. And I think what's really gonna show the European ecosystem has arrived, if you start getting consistent large-scale exits, yeah. uh, particularly in the public markets, and again, just going back, until I think there's a, a solution at a European-wide level to fix a lot of the public market issues in yeah. Europe of being small and fragmented. You can have all the unicorns you want, but if they don't exit, yeah. um, they're not going to create angel investors, yeah. they're and, not going to create ecosystems. And VCs need their returns. That's Everybody needs their returns. Yeah. And so now if you're looking at a VC and if you're looking at, and especially the deep tech sector, um, governments in Europe are not uh, customer first resort, so it's kind of tough to get up and going that way because as a deep tech company, the most important thing you can have is actually customers yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. And that doesn't exist in Europe. Um, and so I think that needs to be fixed. I think you also have to have some sort of public market fix because you can come in, look, I, 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 case in point, so I, I was lecturing at um, a business school in France, HEC. Um, there was one of the ex-students came in. He is now a unicorn, but I remember having lunch with him um, Michael, the, we need to hurry. The day of <laughs> Series B. So, for example, yeah. just looking at, looking at his cap table, right? Over 40% of the cap tables of his two competing term sheets was government money. Yeah. At some point in time, you know, that's almost like, you know, if your kid has a lemonade stand and they say, oh, I sold all my lemonade, but you bought half the lemonade at day one. Yeah. Um, so, again, they're going to have to be able to stand on their own without I understand. that. understand. So, Chris, quickly, and I then, Mario, you're going to yeah, get the final So, one. I think it's about growth stage funding 
We want to cre continue to create an environment where an entrepreneur does not feel the need to sell out a valuable technology company early. Yeah. It's about having the confidence, having the, 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 the financial environment such that there's no need <laughs> to sell. And also making sure the VCs don't put that pressure on the founder to sell too early because that's a whole other structural issue about well, the returns. And, and, and just we could spend an hour on this, but yes. you know, what is emerging, which we're doing something with as well, is this whole idea of relieving that pressure through secondary funds, etc. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, final words, short and sweet, Mario. What do you have to say to this audience? The public sector <coughs> shall not focus at one <coughs> sector only or one stage only in the uh, life of an entrepreneur. We need space technologies for agriculture, we need life sciences, we need circular economy. I just want to say everybody here in Brussels, don't focus at one sector only. Many sectors are needed in deep tech, in, in innovation to drive us and our growth forward. Okay, great. And well, with that, that thank you very much for your yeah. time. Because we forget the right And I really appreciate your insights, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well done. Great.